Um, Ms. Rickard and I are going to kind of tame, tag team each other through a little of this. And so I have a little slideshow um, to present to you. Okay. All righty. So let's see here. All right. So we did introductions. Um, so we're just basically, this is just a real brief kind of little session. And the idea was that you would have a takeaway that you could take with you at the end of this. Um, because we're so small, you're welcome to interrupt and ask questions and that kind of thing. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about writing as a process, um, mind maps, and what it means to read like a writer. So besides being a teacher, I am actually also um, a published author. And I've been doing that um, for about, well, since for a while, for a long time. <laughs> so I come at this, I come at this both as a teacher and um, as a writer and kind of what I notice that um, that helps um, with working with writing. And I will also just say that as a writer, sometimes there's a misconception that we like just do things automatically and it's just easy for us. And I'm here to tell you it's not. Um, there is a process that we work through. And um, so this process I use both when I'm professionally writing and when I'm teaching. Um, and I think one really important thing to remember with writing is just like any of the arts, it is a process. And so what I see the most is students freeze because they try to get too fast to the final draft um, or the final piece of it, and they don't go through the process. And part of going through the process is making a messy draft. Um, and so I always encourage my students that when I'm grading the drafts, I'm not grading them. I'm just giving them completion points. Um, basically, that is so that they have that freedom to be able to do what they need to do to make that messy draft. Um, but good writing really starts with brainstorming and brainstorming can look lots of different ways. Um, I'm going to show you mind maps, but that's not the only way to brainstorm. There's multiple ways. Part of brainstorming is conversation. So one thing that can be really good um, when working with somebody who needs help with writing is having them just talk about their idea. Um, and then one person can be doing a little bit of a mind Mind map if they need to. Um, but a lot of times students will say, well, I don't know, I have all these big ideas. And so just getting those big ideas out and then part of mind mapping is the organization of it. But one thing that can happen is students can shut down if they start into that, um, trying to get it all organized before they just have dumped their ideas on paper or dumped their ideas in conversation. So I always think it's really important to have that step, um, that pre-writing. Then there's a period if there's research needed, um, they can do that. Um, and then there's the mind mapping, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute here. Um, and then there's the messy draft process. Um, only after the messy draft do I really get into with students and I'll say, okay, we're going to work on three things. So maybe in this paper we're writing, we're going to work on your organization. And so we're really going to get that down. Like, do you have a beginning, middle, and end? Do you have an introduction, um, body paragraphs, and conclusion? Or if you're writing a paragraph, do you have a topic sentence, a couple details, and then a concluding sentence. But that piece doesn't come with them. I don't teach it this way until they get to the revising. And again, that's so that their flow can start. Um, I always say it's far easier to take things out than it is to try to get more things on the page when you get to that revising stage. If they're like, we don't have enough information, um, we don't have enough things that we want to write about, then there's something in the top usually that's been missed, a step. Um, and then there's the editing and the proofreading. And there's what we call convention. So a lot of kids will say, I don't think I'm a good writer because I can't spell. And I always say that's only a part of writing. Um, and a lot of times the focus um, can be like, you've got to have spelling correct. But again, that can come in the editing and the proofreading. So when they're up here in the mind mapping and the drafting, um, you know, little eyes, misspelled words, it's okay. And if if they have to do the editing too early, again, that's where they shut down. Um, so allowing them to do that draft, messy draft, and then at the very end, do the editing and proofreading. Um, and again, when I'm working with students, the thing, I don't focus on everything because it's too overwhelming. So um, if I'm working on, let's say, transition words, then that might be something I'm focusing on in editing and proofreading. Um, if I'm working with um, like five or six words that I want them to use for vocabulary or spelling, then that might be where I draw that in in the editing and proofreading. And then maybe I'll look for 
their voice? Do they have a really strong voice? Can I hear them? And I, and that's one big thing I work with the seniors a lot on is I want to hear you. Um, I want to hear you in the passion for your topics. And I want to hear your voice in your um, papers and your essays, how you phrase things, words you use, how you see the world. Um, and so encouraging that um, is a big piece, I think. And especially as a writer too, I really feel that, that having their voice be unique to them. Um, and then the last piece is reflecting with them. And so just asking them if the teacher's given them a criteria list, um, just looking at their paper or their writing and saying, you know, did we, did you include your voice? Did you include your couple spelling words? Did you include your topic sentence? Um, but giving them some ownership at the end of the process. Um, in my classes, there is always a piece where they answer a couple questions and they reflect on how they think they did on the paper so that I have kind of where they feel that they did, um, which keeps the ownership with them in their writing. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah, we have a question, it looks yeah. like. Yeah. Oh, Mindy, I just wanted to um, jump in because this is such an amazing process. And I just wanted to share that you we can take all the elements of this process and apply it to way younger students too, since we have a, a kindergartner in the room, right? So I wanted to share a tiny bit about how I I work with K through 12. I'm having my fourth grader ELD students write stories right now. And I do these kinds of activities with my four-year-old son. So what it can look like for the pre-writing and brainstorming, since he doesn't write right now on his own, is uh, he starts telling me stories every day. And sometimes we do a brainstorming and I'm writing it down for him. I'm modeling the brainstorming. Like he's just going on and on and on. And I'm, he's watching me write it on paper and he's getting excited and pointing at words like, oh, which is this one? And then if, if his story needs a little bit of help, maybe he mentions an octopus and I ask, well, what does the octopus look like? And he struggles a little bit. I'm like, okay, let's look at pictures of an octopus. So I can pull up a pictures and he can use that to help tell me more about the octopus. And then when we are done with the brainstorming, um, then I can help him turn it into better sentences, right? And I can model that for him, his wild and crazy story. Maybe we can turn that into four sentences. And then at the end, I'll read his little story and we reflect on it together. And I have that moment of being proud of his little story that he wrote. So it, all of this, even though it seems really advanced level stuff, it can totally be applied to the much younger child. Right. So the next thing um, I want to jump to is the mind maps. And this often is what I find um, sometimes that students have not had or they don't know how to do this. Um, and so I'm going to show you the basic mind maps. There's a mind map with evidence, which is a little bit more complex and it's more kind of for, geared for the older kids. But the basic mind map, what we call these cluster word webs, um, and I'm happy to put the link in the chat so you have this. Um, I get it from, you can get it in multiple places. Um, and this comes from Houghton Mifflin. It's a book publisher for textbooks. And and, um, they have a list uh, on their website of different graphic organizers. So I use those. But um, this can look as complicated or as simple as you want it to look. So this might be something more that I'm going to use with the older kids. But if I'm using it with a younger student, I would just have one of these bubbles here. So you would have your topic and then you would have like this would be your big topic. And I'll show you. Um, I put this together for Cocker Spaniels. <laughs> So if I was writing about Cocker Spaniels, I have a Cocker Spaniel, um, my topic would go in the middle and then I would have the categories that I wanted to talk about. So those would be my topic sentences for each little paragraph if I was writing it that way. Um, and I could be writing this, what I did when I brainstormed this, I brainstormed it thinking, okay, I could use this information if I was writing something to persuade people of why Cocker Spaniels are good family dogs. Um, if I was writing something to talk about Cocker Spaniels and their health concerns, I could go off there. Um, so I did it kind of 
in a general way. Um, but basically it's your main topic and then your, um, what would be your topic sentences and then your details come into the little bubbles. Um, and this is a really great way. So when a student is talking about their writing, um, this is a great way to capture all their ideas. So whether that is a younger student doing that, working with an adult or an older student um, doing that, this really works. They see it. It's very visual. Um, and I find that it helps helps them. And then they're free. They can make little notes. And sometimes I'll have them um, write other little notes alongside here um, if they have other ideas. But this just will capture everything in one place. And that in itself is half the battle because then suddenly it's not so overwhelming. And then we can look at one section and go, okay, let's just start with the health needs. And um, let's, you know, write a little paragraph about Cocker Spaniels and their health needs and why that might be a concern if a family was adopting a Cocker Spaniel. So something like that. Um, there's also this bigger, and again, this is what I use with the high school kids, um, but this gives more, so they have their main idea or their thesis, and then they have their supporting ideas, and then I have them come up with their evidence there, which would be their research, or if they're reading a short story and they need to analyze it, this is going to be their specific lines. Um, they're citing the story. It's going to go in those boxes. So it's a little bit more specific to um, if you're reading something and then you need to write about that specifically. So then the third little takeaway um, is what I call reading like a writer. Um, and what does that mean? So as a writer, um, it's a, a habit, a daily habit of reading. Um, so I always encourage students to be reading something 15 to 20 minutes a day. That could be an article online. Um, it could be a magazine article. It could be a poem. It could be a short story. It could be whatever they're interested in. But it's that habit of reading that's so important, I think, that builds our writing. Um, it's hard to be a writer without having the reading linked into it. Um, and anything, you know, so so when I taught GED and I've taught GED both at MIWA and um, at a community college, and what we do is we just encourage them to read anything, newspapers, magazines, books, anything you can get your hands on. Um, sometimes there is a misconception that, oh, I can't read the graphic novels or those kinds of things. And I always say, no, anything, anything that has text on it, read 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and then some things to do. So what does it mean to read like a writer? Writer. Um, there's certain things that as a writer, when I'm reading something, I come at it and I teach my students to do this too. So what do I notice about the writing? Do I notice descriptive language? Do I notice the voice, the words that are being used, the organization? Um, what do I wonder? What questions do I have about what I'm reading? What would I ask the author if I could? Um, what questions do I have about the topic? Um, what makes me curious about what I'm reading? Is there something else I want to explore? And then what connections can I make to this and other reading? Um, so is there something else I've read? Have I seen something on TV? Does it have a movie with it? Did I like that or not like it? Whatever connections can be made. And these are just questions to ask students um, when working with them and having them read. You know, at the end of that 15 or 20 minutes, have a little conversation about what they read and um, see how that, see what they have to say. The student in kindergarten, I could take just one moment to share, uh, just to show off, uh, do a little show and tell of a couple of resources that I use with my um, younger elementary ELD students. And um, some of them are used by my son as well. He does not like it when I borrow things from our home to use with the students. He gets very jealous, which is pretty funny. But um, one of the things that he really loves and I really love because I can take it to school with me. Um, and they come with in different levels or and different um, age kind of appropriateness is these whiteboard pen control books. I love these. Um, not only do they have different like kinds of tasks, like trace the maze, but they do have most of them. You can see it's well used. <laughs> you just use a little alcohol wipe to clean it up uh, so they can practice tracing their letters. And it has lots of other activities, too. But, you know, before they can write, they have to be able to control some kind of writing utensil in their hands. So this is great for that. And he loves anything that is um, this one, Mickey Mouse one he really likes, but it's an activity book that it has in practice letters and writing, but also, again, just using pen control, you know, in fun ways to get them to develop those skills. And then this is a big one for early writers. Um, 
this is a, I use with my students all the time. And it's that really, it's harder to find these days. And I don't know why, but it's the really big lines with the little dashed lines and the alternating colors. So if you can find this online and print it out or get a whiteboard, but these are so important with the alternating colored lines and the dashed lines to get them to form their letters correctly at the correct size and in a straight line. Uh, my littles love these. Uh, so I actually give them away <laughs> to my students. <laughs> and then the last one that I wanted to show you um, for the littles, I have different versions of these. They are mats. They can come in larger sizes. These ones are, um, sorry, this yellow doesn't show up well on screen, but this says mop. It's got the picture and they're double-sided cards. And then it comes with a whole bag of the little letters, letter blocks. And so they have to match up the letters and you can use them in all kinds of ways. Um, and what's really fun about the font that they use is that if you flip it, this U over, it's the N. So it's really good because they have to learn to like line it up exactly. And sometimes they have to flip it and they get really confused, but it really helps them understand like which direction the tail goes, right? When they're forming the letter. And um, so it's a good tactile. Yeah, and these are easy to find online, these kinds of games. Okay.